Chapter Twenty Eight of One Commonplace Day by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Where is John? But Miss Fanny Copeland was not to get away from the temperance question that day. It followed her upstairs to her pretty room. She heard Holly's voice below. He had brought the mail, and her mother called to her that there was a letter from Mildred. She went to the head of the stairs to receive it and promised to come down presently and read it aloud for her mother was very fond of Mildred. But Fanny did not read that letter to her mother. It was a long letter. There was a brief account of home engagements and plans, and then the writer plunged into the subject which evidently filled her heart. "'And now, dear Fanny, at the risk of seeming to force your confidence, I want to ask you whether there is any truth in the rumour which reaches me through outside parties that you are very intimate with that Mr. Bruce.' We are dear friends, Fanny, you and I, and you must forgive me for speaking plainly. I hope there is nothing in it, because I am afraid for that young man. There is a lady in the mission rooms who has a brother belonging to one of the departments. He visited her yesterday and had just returned from Eastwood. He visits at the Flemings. You may have seen him, though he says he did not meet you there last week. Well, he had a number of Eastwood names, and among them that of young Bruce. He said it is common report in Fred Fleming's set that the young man is drinking. Fred Fleming declared that it was so, and that something ought to be done to save him. Poor Fred needs saving, you know. It is pitiful, is it not, to think of his trying to save another from coming after him on the downward road? Fanny, I have not been able to think of anything else since I talked with that young man. I am afraid that the reports about Mr. Bruce's habits are too true. It seems this young man, whose name is Weston, used to know a family by the name of Bruce, and interested himself to discover whether this was any connection. So he heard much about him from several sources. I don't credit the report of your intimacy, and shall not, until I hear it from you, because I know how fond Eastwood is of gossiping in those directions. I hope to receive a letter from you by return mail, telling me that it is all nonsense. Still, Fanny dear, I have such a sore heart that I cannot help warning you, even though I hope and pray that it may be unnecessary. You remember Leonard Airedale, of course? You remember how sure you were that he did not drink wine? I liked to hear you say so, yet I did not believe it even then. Something about him made me afraid. I persisted until I found that he did. When he went to Chicago, he was under a very solemn promise to me not to touch another drop. I tried to have him sign a regular pledge, but that he would not do. He said that he considered the pledge made to me more sacred. Fanny, he has gone down, down, broken that pledge and every other that an honorable man could. I have been rescued, I suppose, from the depths. I thank God for saving me, but it has been at the expense of a sore heart. That is why I am writing all this to you. I hope I am coming before there has been time for any sick hearts. Fanny, my dear friend, don't trust a man who ever touches a drop of alcohol for medicine, or in any other conceivable way. It has been Leonard Airedale's ruin. Don't trust the common promise of any man who has ever tasted the stuff. There is a demon in it to drag men down. I would not trust any man, save on his knees, asking God's grace to help him keep the pledge which he has taken before God and men. A man who will not take a pledge to help him keep from doing what he says he does not intend to do, is, I believe, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, not sincere, and wants to leave a loophole for his possible indulgence." and any young man who in the light of to-day does not stand squarely in the front of the battle and work with brain and voice and vote for the cause of total abstinence is i believe not sincere how can he be when everybody admits that souls are being ruined by the curse of liquor then am i not bound to lift up my voice and as soon as i can get a chance give my vote against it suppose i accomplish nothing has god ever asked me to accomplish has he not simply asked me to try? If I try and try and try and fail, will he hold me accountable for the failure? But if I do not try, simply because it seems almost certain that I shall fail, am I free from responsibility? 
Forgive me, Fanny, I did not mean to write you a temperance lecture, but I feel deeply on this whole question. It has burned me. I would not have you suffer a fraction of what I have. Let me beg you, dear friend, to open your eyes very wide to this question, and take such ground as you will wish you had when we stand at the judgment with all the ruined fathers and sons and brothers and husbands and lovers who are going to meet us there. There was much more, but I have given you enough to show you that Fanny Copeland had her warning. I cannot tell you that she heeded it lightly. She was indignant over it. She cried over it she was fearful over it. That very Friday evening, when young Bruce came into her mother's parlor, and asked if he might rest there until it was time to go to the train for the doctor, she proposed that instead they go, he and she, to the temperance meeting in the hall, and go from there to the train. He had fifteen excuses. The night was dark and unusually damp. He was sure her father would not like to have her out, it was a long walk from the hall to the train. Her father was to bring an important piece of medical machinery with him, which must be transported from the train to the office with great care. He should need to take the sleigh. It was not large enough for three. The proposition began to look unreasonable. Why didn't he attend those meetings occasionally? He had not time. Was he interested in the question? Well, yes, in a sense, all men were. He did not believe in the extreme measures of some, in fact, he was not fanatically inclined in any direction he believed. And yet Eben Bruce's conscience said to him then and there, "'Bruce, you are talking like a fool. If anybody ought to be a fanatic on this subject, you ought, and you know it.' Had he signed the pledge? Why, no, he hadn't. When he was a youngster, his mother had not approved of pledges. A little of the old notion clung to him now, he supposed. Then his conscience said again, No, it isn't, Eben Bruce. That is all nonsense. You have proved it in argument. It is a new notion which clings to you, a feeling that you cannot consent to put it out of your power, morally speaking, to indulge that horrible craving for alcohol which sometimes comes upon you. You are too weak to want to do it, though you hate its chains and are afraid of its power." "'Don't you believe in pledges of any kind?' asked Fanny. The young man, under a spell of the earnest eyes which were looking at him, more full of soul than they ever had been before, arose and went over to her side, and dropped into the seat before her, and said, "'Yes, I do. I believe in our pledging ourselves, now and here, to be the best and dearest friends to each other that the world has ever known. Will you take that pledge with me, Fanny?' That was a master stroke of the enemy. Fanny, startled, flushed, confused, pleased, forgot caution and fear and the future, and the golden opportunity passed. It was a decent and decorous funeral that they gave the body of poor old Joel Hartzell. Dr. Brandon came and conducted the service. He was no stranger to the house by this time. He had knelt frequently by the silent old man during the weeks past, and asked God to have mercy on his soul. He was familiar with the story of those last days. He had himself seen a gleam of intelligence on the old face that last time he called, and heard a murmured Amen to his petition. On the whole, Dr. Brandon read the words, It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, over the bruised and battered and sadly ill-used old body, with a sense of awe and wonder and grave delight, such as he did not often experience. To think that there was a Saviour great enough and good enough not only to forgive old Joel Hartzell, but to raise up for him a glorious body, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing. "'Verily we have a wonderful Saviour,' he said to Mr. Cleveland, as the two stood together over the wreck that life and death had made, and saw, both of them, the look of something almost like dignity that the old face had taken up in its last sleep. "'Aye, that we have,' said Mr. Cleveland. "'And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That is wonderful, too. No human being can think of old Joel as a saint, but God will.' Miss Wainwright's carriage held John and his wife and Kate. Mr. Cleveland's carriage led the way, with the minister beside him. And there followed a carriage which held Miss Wainwright and Miss Hunter, and another with the doctor and Holly. 
this little bit of thoughtfulness touched kate almost more than any of the numberless other kindnesses had it was so unexpected and in the eyes of the world so unnecessary do you know just how strange the house to which they returned seemed to them it was in nice order the bed had been neatly made up and was empty the little stand which had stood at the head of the bed and held glasses and spoon and lamp all needful things was empty save for the little lamp which newly filled stood waiting for them kate lighted it for the early twilight was already setting in and shaded it from the bed then quickly took the shade away there was no need for it now she sat down in the rocking chair which had been brought from somewhere weeks ago for her comfort and folded her hands and looked about her it was a strange feeling she was at leisure the occupation which had held body and mind for weeks was gone there was a strange sense of desolation she had not thought to deeply mourn her father but one night that last night of his life he had said to her kiss me kate you used to when you were a little girl poor kate i shall be out of your way in a little while i meant to take such good care of you i promised her i would and i didn't i don't know but she will be disappointed at seeing me do you think she will and kate had answered quickly oh no father oh father no she will be glad and i will come and john he had said quickly with an upward inflection in his voice and she had said it after him assuringly and john it took with her all the sacredness of a pledge as she thought of this last talk the tears came thick and fast she was missing her father yet there was a strange sweetness in the tears it was so blessed to think that he lived even so little bit of a life that could be sweetly missed mrs john hartzell went about softly preparing the neat supper she was sorry for kate she had never thought to feel a shadow of regret for the father whom she had known only as a trial but there had been some last words in the stillness of the night spoken also to her she did not tell them but she treasured them thus in silence and peace the evening gathered around them suddenly wife and sister awoke at once to the same question a startled look in the eyes of both where is john he went home with the chairs from the corner mrs hartzell said and he said that while he was about it he would step down to dunlap's and get a little flour i must bake to-morrow and the flour is all gone but i thought he would be back before this time i told him we would have tea early kate gave a quick little exclamation as quickly suppressed but it sounded a note of warning to the wife she looked up startled why kate you don't think and then she stopped her face blanched with fear she had not thought of it before it was so easy to learn to trust one's husband when one wants to trust him and john's step had been so firm during the past weeks it was not possible that she was to be plunged back into the living death from which she had been creeping up could she bear it would not the merciful grave which they had seen closed that afternoon open again and take her in could she bear the suspense for an hour she rose up and began to walk rapidly back and forth in the little room kate she said fiercely you don't think you can't believe i don't know said kate drawing a hard slow breath john is tired he has been under a heavy strain and he has been excited all day and there are fiends abroad in the town do you think they will ever forget that evening these two women sitting beside the empty bed watching out of the west window and the south window glancing now and then at the untasted supper on the table listening to the dreary song of the neglected tea-kettle listening constantly for the sound of footsteps which came not they did not sit inertly they went first the wife and then the sister out into the night and the darkness down the steps down the lane out to first one corner and then the other and crept back after a little alone frightened almost maddened with anxiety and fear before the midnight of that awful night was reached earth seemed to the two to contain nothing sweeter than that lately closed grave oh to be hidden out of sight and sound within its quiet arms 
It was midnight when John Hartzell came home. His wife was out on the steps peering down into the darkness. She heard him, stumbling, swearing, knocking violently at a post which he fancied ran against him. She shrank into shadow as he passed her. But she need not have cowered back. He was too drunk to see her in the dim twilight. He stumbled into the house and sank down a limp heap on the broken step. Oh, God, she said, oh, God. Do you think it was not a prayer, and that the pitying God will not see that she is avenged? Kate had fled to the little closet room, from whence, after the drunkard had thrown himself on that neat and so recently vacated bed, and was lost to sound, she stole out in search of the wife. Oh, Annie, she said in low and pitiful tones, poor Annie, come in, dear, you will die out here in the cold. He will not hear us. Come, let me help you in. And the poor wife looked up at the young girl, her eyes tearless, her face white with agony. But she only repeated that solemn, awful name. Oh, God! God is in heaven, Annie, and he hears. Be sure he hears. The time is coming when he will avenge his own. We belong to him, Annie, and father belongs to him. Let me help you in and she fairly lifted the stricken wife in her arms and bore her into that closet where the rest of that night was spent. End of chapter 28